With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles, we win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woo a hand clapper, a high-fiver. I kind of like the high-five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At ChumbaCasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino-style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses, so don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. VGW group. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Tokyo 2020. It's all anyone in Olympic and Paralympic sport is thinking about. The GB hockey teams are there after qualifying wins at the Lee Valley Centre in the Olympic Park, including the defending women's champions from Rio in 2016. More than 40 members of the British Athletics squad are in Dubai for the World Para Athletics Championships, all with an eye on Tokyo. And was the International Olympic Committee right to strip the city of hosting the marathons and race walks and move them to Sapporo? Tokyo 2020, it's all we're going to be talking about on Anything But Footy. A full hockey roundup, a special preview of the Power Athletics, and we go international as a Canadian racewalker, Evan Dunphy, joins us to say the IOC is wrong and hypocritical. I'm John. And I'm Michael, and this is Anything But Footy, your Olympic and Paralympic sport podcast, where we aim to deliver all you need to know about all your favourite sports. Coming up, as we said, we'll be hearing from athletes representing Great Britain and Northern Ireland in those IPC World Athletics Championships. We'll be speaking to members of the British team. British Cycling have been in action on a new bike in Minsk ahead of the World Cup in Glasgow next weekend. And we'll be talking more about that new bike that they have unveiled ready for Tokyo 2020. And GB Taekwondo have been in the medals at the European Championships in Italy. We'll round up all the latest news for you. Plus, as we've said, continued controversy over the staging of the marathons and racewalks next summer. And much, much more as well. It's all on Anything But Footy. And you can get in touch with us at any time at Anything But F on Twitter. Or you can message us on Insta and Facebook. And please share and subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts. Again, thank you for everybody who has done that this week. Uh, It really helps with our rating for Apple. uh, So please do do that if you can. Now, we talked about this a few weeks back. Moving the marathons, the men's and women's 26.2 miles and race walks from Tokyo for the Olympics next summer to 500-odd miles away to Sapporo, where apparently it's just a few degrees lower in temperature. Now, it's going to be warm in Tokyo for the Olympics from July and August next year, an average temperature of 30 or 31 Celsius in the daytime. The IAAF was criticised, of course, for running the road events in Doha in such conditions, even though they took place at midnight at the World Athletics Championships, and a third of competitors didn't finish the women's marathon, for example. Great Britain's Charlotte Perdue was one of them and told The Telegraph this week that she wants an apology from Lord Sebastian Coe, who runs World Athletics, for making them compete in the heat. But that's not the only story here. Tokyo 2020 officials are fuming the decision was taken by the IOC without consultation. Athletes are all also unhappy about it and some say competitors just didn't prepare properly for conditions in Doha. But the IOC says this week it won't be changing its mind. Who would have thought, Michael, before nine months before Tokyo 2020, a huge row has broken out over these huge events, the marathons and the race walks? 
Well, it makes a change from us sitting here nine months out discussing whether stadiums and venues will be complete <laughs> because, as we know this week, the gymnastics venue in Tokyo uh, was, was pretty much handed over and I think they've only got three more of their, their key venues to complete and they're all due before the end of the year. So from that point of view, Tokyo is, is well on track. But yes, this is a huge row and it's one that's actually dividing the marathon running and the race walking community because, as you say there, you've got Charlotte Perdue who's very anti uh, events like this being held in these kind of conditions. On the other hand, and I, I've interviewed and met Charlotte many times, um, and you know I've always been interested to hear what she's got to say and respect her views, clearly. But on the other hand, Tom Bosworth is another athlete that I know pretty well, and I respect his views, and he's on the other side of the argument, on the other side of the debate. And he says, well, he did well. Uh, at the at the championships in Doha because he trained for those conditions and and that is part I guess of preparing for a major event and he's been training or is beginning training has his plan for training for the conditions in Tokyo and now I think he feels a little bit put out the fact that he's now got to go 800 kilometers away to take part in his event so you know he won't be able to stay in the village um, which obviously he did when they arrived from the holding camp in Rio he won't feel as though he's part of the Olympic Games in many respects and also I, I feel sorry I think for the people of Tokyo and the the governor of Tokyo said it was a decision without agreement which sounds a bit like <laughs> parenting to me uh, you make lots of decisions without agreement don't you when you have toddlers um, Thomas Buck of the IOC has actually written to her the governor of, of Tokyo uh, has discussed staging a celebratory mass participation event in Tokyo at a later date. Uh, that sounds to me that something that, that's lovely on paper. Uh, not sure in principle uh, that it will get much interest. Certainly won't get the global TV audiences that an Olympic marathon uh, will get on the penultimate or the final morning of the Games. Uh, the Paralympic events, they don't seem to be moving, so it doesn't seem to be an issue. I know the Paralympics take place slightly later on in the year. And the medal ceremonies are still to be held in Tokyo as well. So imagine that. You've won a 50 kilometer world gold, uh, Olympic gold uh, medal, and then you've got to get 800 kilometers in your car or or on the bullet train uh, to go and get your medal as well doesn't sound a lot of fun does it certainly doesn't and as you mentioned athletes are on either side of the argument now canadian race walker evan dunphy who's been tweeting a brilliant thread this week if you want to have a look at it i'd highly recommend it at evan dunphy it is it's worth digging out and having a read about his feelings on it he says the number of of did not finishes or DNFs, uh, DNFs uh, in women's marathon is not that unusual in the world championships as people push themselves for glory and there's all and also because of the late timing of the championships this year more people thought they'd give up and conserve energy ahead of the big city marathons Chicago the other week that we talked about on anything but footy New York this weekend now he says 28 DNFs which is about 41% dropped out in Doha in the women's marathon in 31 degrees heat. He also says in 2017 in London, the last World Championships before Doha, 14% dropped out of the women's marathon, despite the temperature being 19 degrees. And in London 2012 as well, something we talk about a lot on anything but footy, 9% didn't finish. He also points out the men's marathon in Osaka in 07 had a 50% dropout, but the Olympics went ahead in Beijing one year later. So it's not that uncommon, but he thinks the narrative we've been told is that it was uncommon. Now, I'm delighted that Evan joins us on anything but footy. So, Evan, you think the IOC are, are quite plainly wrong? I'm still kind of in shock that the IOC has done this um, and done it so unilaterally. Uh, they didn't consult athletes. They didn't consult the IAAF. They didn't consult Tokyo or Sapporo. Um, they made a reactionary decision in light of all the negative media reports that had come out, uh, mainly to do with the women's marathon in, in Doha around how many athletes DNF'd and, and all these images of athletes collapsing and, and this, that, and the other thing. And without going into it too much, like I think a lot of that media attention was was used, you know, I think those women were used as a pawn uh, by the media to push their narrative that they didn't want the world championships in Doha and they want to punish the IAAF for, for hosting them there. Um, you know, that, that's just my opinion. And, and I tried to provide as much evidence as I could uh, in my little Twitter stream of consciousness um, around the fact that those scenes that we saw in Doha, they aren't unique to Doha. I mean, 
athletes pushing themselves to their limit um, at every major championships in every weather condition push beyond that limit sometimes and collapse and, and, and drop out. And um, that's just sort of the nature of, of sport. And uh, yeah, it sucks that the IOC saw those images and reacted to protect their own brand. I mean, they're terrified of the negative PR that could come from those same scenes in Tokyo. Um, they've ignored the fact that they'll still have those exact same scenes in Sapporo. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's neither here nor there. We'll, we'll get to that when we, when we get to that. Now, the IOC president, Thomas Bach, said athletes' health and well-being are always at the heart of our concerns. They've announced further restrictions for athletics with 5,000 metres and longer distance races scheduled in the evening athletic sessions. In rugby, all morning games scheduled to finish before 12 noon. In cycling, mountain bikes start delay to 3 p.m. But as Michael said, this hasn't affected the Paralympics at all. No, no other uh, discussions have taken place with Tokyo organisers. So, Evan, you don't think this is a case, this is the case, do you? And you actually accusing the IOC of hypocrisy. What they basically said is that Tokyo is unsafe, Sapporo is safe. So that's created two interesting storylines here. You know, I've heard from several several athletes who are happy with the decision to move the events that, oh great, you know, now it's in Sapporo, it's colder in Sapporo, we don't have to prepare for the heat. Obviously it could only be, it might only be one or two degrees cooler in Sapporo. Um, and now you have the risk of athletes showing up not having done heat prep and potentially at greater risk than had the race been kept in Tokyo. So, you know, that's one issue that I think needs to be elucidated further. But um, the other one is saying that, okay, Tokyo is unsafe for the marathoners and the race walkers, yet the open water swimming, the triathlon, um, those events are, are staying. Um, despite the fact that in recent test events in Tokyo, they've had massive issues. Um, open water swimming event where, 2012 Olympic gold medalist came out and said that's the hottest water he's ever swam in. Um, issues around the E. coli levels, the recent para triathlon test event had to cancel the swim section and make it a duathlon because the E. coli levels in the bay were too high. And so this whole idea that the IOC is protecting athlete welfare is just utter nonsense. Um, and by saying that Tokyo is unsafe, they're also saying that we don't care about the welfare of these athletes. So it's created a really interesting divide now, and we'll see where it goes from here. But, um, you know, it's certainly been interesting to, to hear them try to defend their decision. And you know, I look forward to them providing sort of more information about how they came to this decision. Because I think that would really help the athletes understand where they stand on, and on safety and whether or not they're going to be safe in Tokyo. So, yeah, as things continue to unfold, it'll be It'll be pretty interesting to see, see what comes out from here. Well, Evan, thank you. It seems like this argument isn't going away. The IOC say it's a final decision, but 2020 organisers, as well as athletes, want to know more about the decision process and why they're not consulted first. And, Michael, just quickly on this, I think you summed up brilliantly in our, in our pod, uh, episode 29, what can you do in nine months? It's not fair on organisers and the people of Tokyo who are paying for these games. No, it's not fair. And, I, you know, it's the athletes, um, the likes of Tom Bosworth and others, I think, first and foremost, that I feel sorry for because, you know, they want to they want to win their Olympic medals. They want to compete. They they train so hard for this moment. You know, we talk so much about winning medals. I think, you know, it's certainly in our in our spin off podcast, Great British Bosses. I think we've now got a better understanding that sometimes it's not all about winning medals. And actually just to get to an Olympic Games is an achievement in itself. You know, and you know, a top 10 finish in the Olympic Games is still a huge achievement. And it's those athletes that have trained and, and worked so hard their entire life. And it is very hard to be an Olympic athlete. We were with 25 of them in Stratford recently celebrating the National Lottery's birthday. And that was the message from all of them. It's very, very hard to get to the Olympics. Then to feel that you've had your little moment in the limelight running, walking around the host city um, for the sake of what appears to be a bit of a PR exercise off the back of the World Athletics Championships, must be incredibly frustrating and incredibly hard for those individuals concerned.
if, as the IOC say, it is about athletes, then hopefully they'll listen to people like Evan. And uh, good luck, Evan, in your campaign to try and get this changed because it feels like it's the wrong decision uh, yet again uh, from the athletic uh, from the athletic authorities. Now, Great Britain's defending women's hockey champions have booked their place for Team GB at Tokyo 2020. A 5-1 aggregate win over Chile, who were ranked 18th in the world, was more than enough at the Lee Valley Hockey Tennis Centre in the Olympic Park. So congratulations to the defending champions. One of six Rio gold medalists in the starting lineup, Laura Unsworth scored the second goal in three minutes to ensure a 2-1 victory in the second match of those Olympic qualifiers. Tess Howard opened the scoring, while in a wet and windy conditions in the first match, Izzy Petter, Hannah Martin and Anna Toman were also all on target. And it is a British double because the British men are through to Tokyo as well after a 9-3 aggregate win over Malaysia. Alan Forsyth scored a hat-trick in the 5-3 victory in the second match, clocking up his 100th international goal. Malaysia had taken the lead in the tie in the first game, uh, causing slightly some alarm bells, but put, put four goals in the space of 14 second half minutes for Britain, ensured victory in that and that aggregate victory. And British men haven't won a medal, of course, since gold in 1988 and the bronze in 1984 the hardest part as Michael's been saying is getting to the Olympics so well done to both teams but they will desperately need to improve if they are to win a medal and the next home fixtures will be in May when the Pro League returns India and China the first opponents Interesting development from the British Olympic Association, the BOA and the Athletes Commission this week. They've published a new and updated Rule 40 guidelines ahead of the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games. Now, stay with me on this. Uh, Rule 40 doesn't sound particularly interesting, but it basically governs athletes' commercial opportunities and their rights at games time. And there is now a new flexible agreement in place. That means that athletes can now use their social media to thank a personal sponsor. Now, I actually um, was involved in, in an issue like this in, in Rio with a swimmer, Amy Wilmot, who I know quite well because we live quite close to each other. Now, she had a personal sponsor, a local financial management company called Active Financial Management, who'd backed her all the way to Rio, but she was not allowed during the period of the Olympic Games to say any personal thank you or offer them any support for the support and the thanks that they had given her in getting her to the Games. But this is now going to be changing ahead of Tokyo 2020. Uh, The athletes have been reminded they do need to still balance official Olympic sponsors and those duties with their personal sponsorship opportunities and the rules in place on their personal sponsorship opportunities are still as I said pretty strict it is basically they are now allowed uh, to give one sort of social media message across multi-platforms to each personal sponsor when they do that message they're not allowed to be in kit or have any team GB or IOC Olympic branding so they can't do it in front of the Olympic rings and they're certainly not allowed to post field of play footage as well now Tom Daly got in a bit of trouble because he was posting sort of behind the scenes videos in the Olympic Village and the Olympic Village is considered part of the field of play at the Olympic Games Greg Rutherford the gold medal winning long jumper from 2012 has been critical of this in the past it does seem a bit outdated to me and I just think on the final point on this what we need to establish what we just need to get across is UK sport is the government agency that is responsible for allocating the money to the individual sports to then spend on the support staff, the medical staff, the coaching staff, and to put a wage essentially in these elite athletes pockets. But team GB doesn't get central government funding. It needs to raise 60 million pounds every four year Olympic cycle. And they do that through domestic sponsorship. So the athletes have an opportunity here with that domestic sponsorship plus the IOC worldwide partners the likes of Coca-Cola, Visa, Amiga, Toyota and others to then top it up with a bit of personal sponsorship whether that's a an energy drink that they use maybe or as I said there with Amy Warner a financial services company but they are now going to be allowed to use their little moment in the sun uh, which it will be in Tokyo as we know in 2020 just to thank those personal sponsors but they still won't be allowed to go too overboard. 
I think it's the right decision, though, very quickly, because social media has changed the way that, you know, our, our athletes can communicate with people. And also it's great news for those smaller sponsors. You know, that's the that's the message I would say is, you know, it's everyone's not Katarina Johnson Thompson or Dina Asher Smith or Tom Daly with massive sponsors. Some of them, as you mentioned, uh, have got amazing support from smaller companies. And I think it's the right thing to have done. Team USA kind of kicked it off. And I'm glad that Team GB have followed likewise. Still to come on Anything But Footy, we will look ahead to the World Para Athletics Championships and we'll be talking cycling and that brand new bike for Great Britain as well. It does have two wheels. I can confirm that for you. Uh, but some other quick news for you. Congratulations to Ashley McKenzie, who won silver at Judo's Australia Oceanic Open this weekend. The recently crowned British Judo Male Player of the Year for 2019 also earned vital Olympic qualifying points with his second place. Sally Conway was crowned Female Player of the Year for British Judo. In Taekwondo, the GB team have been in action in the European Championships in Italy. Uh, there was a bronze for the para-Taekwondo athlete Amy Truesdale that effectively secures her place in Tokyo for the Paralympics. Jay Jones, double Olympic champion, of course, uh, won a silver. Bradley Sindon might be a new name for a few people. He won a silver medal as well. And in the final couple of events at the European Championships, there were a couple of British golds to bring you news of. Lauren Williams, uh, the youngster, was leading before her opponent from France withdrew with injury, but she picked up that gold medal. And Bianca Walton, who's been a world champion, now a European champion, and will chase that elusive Olympic gold medal, I'm sure, in Tokyo in less than 10 months' time. We thought the Doha 2019 World Athletics Championships were late. Now more than 1,400 athletes from 122 countries are set to compete in the ninth edition of the World Power Athletics Championships, getting underway this week in Dubai from November 7th. Remember, two years ago, it was in London in 2017. Britain's Paralympic champion, Kadena Cox, has been named as one of the 10 women to watch by the Paralympic Committee. She's the double Paralympic gold medalist in two different sports, the Para Athletics 400 metres, T38 and the time trial cycling in Rio, of course. So uh, amazing uh, success that she's had. The 28-year-old will be searching for her third World Championship gold in Dubai and then focusing on Tokyo. Uh, she had talked about competing in both the Olympics and Paralympics next year in cycling, but I think it is mainly now the Paralympic focus for her. She's one of 10 top female athletes from 10 different countries who have the potential to make headlines, say the IPC, at the biggest para sport event of the year in Dubai. And a couple before we talk about the British team, Michael, I thought were worth mentioning. Uh, Vanessa Lowe of Australia, who's the German-born Paralympic champion, uh, will make her major competition debut for Australia. Uh, she it takes place in the women's long jump, T63, so worth keeping an eye on her. Hong Zhuangzhou of China, the Chinese wheelchair racer, has dominated the T53 class for more than a decade, with six Paralympic and seven World Championship gold medals to her name. And also Marlene van Gensven of Netherlands. The Netherlands really strong in sprinting. The T64 sprinter broke the 100 metre world record at the uh, Notville GP Grand Prix five months ago on her blades. So we wish her well as well. And in the men's category, of course, Jason Smith of Ireland, the Irish sprinter, faces fierce competition to keep the position of the world's fastest Paralympian. But no other athlete since London 2012 has won his category, the men's 100 metre T13 finals in major events. It's going to be good over the next a week and a half, I think, in Dubai. Yeah, I hope so. I'll be very interested, obviously, how it compares to, to London. I, I think it will be very difficult for Dubai um, to stage something that, uh, you know, that, that plays out as well as London did. I thought the, the IPC World Championships in London were just fantastic. Clearly very well supported. Action on the trap was good. And Great Britain and Northern Ireland have got 10 defending world champions from London returning uh, to this team. A team of around 40. Remember, no Johnny Peacock and Steph Reid. Both of those two are pulled out. But you have got the likes of Hannah Cockcroft and Richard Whitehead, who are looking for a record fourth consecutive world title. Uh, you've got Ali Davis and Holly Arnold, who hold three at the moment. Uh, some debutantes in that British and Northern Irish team. Owen Miller. Uh, Anna Nicholson, Eleanor Simpson and Lydia Church and the Great Britain and Northern Ireland team remember in London on home track on the home track uh, broke most world records of course as well so you know I think um, you mentioned Kadena Cox there 
Anna Cockroft as well, I think, kind of joint top of the bill. Ten-time uh, world champion as well. But then you've got London 2017 champions like Olivia Breen and Sophie Camlish and Sammy Kinghorn as well. And You know, what's, I think, worth mentioning as well about the, the Great Britain and Northern Ireland team, certainly in London, uh, most of the medals or the majority of the medals, 59% of the medals were won by the women. Um, we also... See Libby Clegg back after the birth of her son Edward, a double Paralympic champion, and a new event as well on the schedule, a race running event. Now, Great Britain and Northern Ireland uh, won two titles and four medals when it was trialled at the European Championships last year. And race running is um, an innovative new event using basically a custom built tricycle without pedals. So it supports you as you walk or run, and it's for athletes with severe coordination impairments as well. So that gets on the programme uh, for these World Paralympic Athletics Championships. We're also going to see some newer names coming through as well. You mentioned some of the debutants, but I wanted to highlight a couple, and they've been speaking to anything but footy. Three-time Paralympic medalist uh, Carrie Adenegan had a brilliant 2018, winning gold for the first time and setting a world record. Now, she competes in the T34, 100 metres and 800 metres, but she'll be up against Hurricane Hannah Cockroft. Uh, but amidst the rivalry is good for the sport, and she's told anything but footy she's ready to do her best. I'm really excited. It'll be my third world champ, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, it should be fun. It'll be a nice way of finishing off the year and such a long season as well. Yeah, I haven't competed there, but I've been there on holiday, so I know what it's like to be in Dubai, and I think that has helped a bit, knowing that it's going to be hot and just being prepared for it physically and mentally. I do like the heat. I don't mind it, and I think especially with my disability, cerebral palsy, sometimes the heat is quite good just to relax the muscles and things like that. So I think after having about a week there, you know, climatising, I should be ready to compete, and I think I'll feel better actually being out there. Yeah, I had a great season last year, getting my first senior gold in the 100 metres at the European and also getting my first um, world record as well the same year. So I have got a lot more confidence in myself. Like I know what I'm capable of at my best. So it's important to go to Dubai and do my very best and try and be at my best. And then I know that as long as I'm at my best, like I should have a great time and, and should be able to win more medals. It is great and it's fun to have a rivalry and it's fun just to get excited about the races and, and know that you know anything can happen in the races. So that's really good and it's exciting for people to be excited by our races as well but it's just about focusing on myself and focusing on my performance and just enjoying it and that 100 meter final is sunday morning november the 10th if you want to see hannah cockcroft against carrie anna negan and uh, the others go in that and like i mentioned the world athletics championships in doha these para worlds are really really late in the season and they've meant a total change of plans for coaching now paralympic champion holly arnold is hoping to retain her world title and win gold for a fourth time after making her international debut in 2008 then coming fifth at london 2012 she won the f46 javelin at the rio paralympics four years later and then the world title in 2013 15 and 17 and again anything but footy's been catching up with her and she says she can't wait for these championships which will also help in the planning to defend her paralympic title excited and nervous to go out to dubai but um it's just great to be a part of a you know it's kind of like a smaller team but um i think it's a really nice mix of the team together so i'm excited to go out there and see what we can all achieve it's awesome to just put that vest on every time you go out to compete and i can't believe this is actually my fifth world champs um so i was trying to work out earlier how many i actually been to so um i'm just going to go out there and do my absolute best and i of course i want to defend that title and and get that four times world champion status but it's also about enjoying myself and just um trying to just trying to figure out, I guess, more of a stepping stone ready for Tokyo as well. I think that's really important. Um, and obviously to use the heat and how the competition's going to be, whether it's, it's going to replicate kind of the same thing in Tokyo. And that's really important, but I'm really, really excited. Yeah, so me and my coach, Dave Turner, we've obviously had to dealt with lots of different things and we've um, kind of delayed more of a winter training. Obviously, um, everything's slightly different. And obviously last year, competing in Commonwealth Games so early, I had to peak for April and then we've got such a long time now obviously then till November um, it, it's hard to keep on top of it all time and try you know 
it felt so long at the beginning of the year to see the goal, the end goal at November. And obviously now I can't believe how fast it's creeped up to us. But um, it's all about trusting in the process. And I trust my I trust my coach. I trust the team around me. And, you know, go out there and we've got a preparation plan. And let's stick to it. And hopefully everything works out. And the Javelin final, Monday evening, November the 11th. Uh, the action starts from November 7th, week and a half of it. We wish, of course, as Michael said, the team of nearly just over 40 British athletes all the success in the world. And I should just mention as well, I think I called it the World Paralympic Athletics Championships. Um, that That is a mistake on my part and one I think uh, winds up people actually that have competed in the Paralympics because uh, just because you're a disabled athlete doesn't necessarily make you a Paralympian. And that's something that Hannah Cockcroft has reminded me of several times. And I know she's she's mentioned it on her social media, of course. It's the IPC World Athletics Championships, of course, in Dubai. Slap this, on the wrist. Yeah, slap on the wrist. Well, it's a mistake that a lot of people make, and it's all about the, this issue of branding, isn't it? And, and Team GB and, and Para GB are separate entities, but people will talk about Hannah Cockcroft or Johnny Peacock or Will Bailey being part of Team GB when they're actually part of Para GB. And I think people, when they talk about disabled sport, just immediately label it Paralympic sport, but obviously... The Paralympics is an event in itself. Anyway, uh, this is anything but footy. Still to come, we'll be talking rowing. Uh, We've got some table tennis news as well and a bit more athletics coming your way very shortly as well. And just a plug as well, if I can, for our spin-off podcast, which is called Great British Bosses. Now, we've done... Uh, we will be having six episodes in our first series of Great British Bosses as well. They are uh, Some of them are now available. Adrian Christie, the man in charge of badminton in this country. Uh, Sarah Sutcliffe from Table Tennis. Jack Buckner, who's uh, the man in charge of British Swimming. And Georgina Usher, who is in charge of British Fencing. And we will have a brand new episode dropping this week as well. You can get in touch with us. Uh, you can go on our website, anythingbutfooty.com. You can email us, anythingbutfooty at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at anythingbutfooty.com. But if we're on Facebook, Instagram or YouTube, uh, don't forget Apple or Google Podcasts. Find us on Spotify. Give us a follow on social media and do rate us and leave us a comment on your podcast provider platform. Now, it is official. It is another Lotus bike and it has got two wheels. British Cycling revealed their new bike for the 2020 season and Tokyo Olympics, which has been specially put together by Hope Technology, which are a Lancashire based world leading design and manufacturing company and lotus engineering the second time british cycling has teamed up with the famous racing car match manufacturer that green of course of norfolk and a return to cycling i knew you were gonna mention (laughs) norfolk i was waiting for it of course and a return to cycling for the first time in 25 years for lotus in homage to the iconic 92 barcelona olympic gold medal winning bike ridden by chris boardman which we've talked about on anything but footy in the last couple of weeks the bike has a crucial lightweight design and aerodynamic efficiency that is needed for british cycling and of course our athletes and british riders have started using it at their manchester home of british cycling and they are also using it in glasgow and at minsk for the first world cups of the season yeah the mince world cup is just drawn to a close as we record this episode of anything but footy there were medals plenty of them as well for the uh, british cyclists out there the gold medal for mark stewart in the points race uh, also a gold medal for matt walls in the omnium we saw silver medals in the men's team sprint behind the netherlands and a silver medal for Laura Kenny and Emily Nelson in the Madison as well. There was a silver medal for John Archibald in the individual pursuit behind Filippo Gano of Italy, who broke two world records. So he is a man bang on form at Whoa. the moment. And a bronze for Laura Kenny in the Omnium as well. Wasn't such a good weekend for Jason Kenny. He went out in the quarterfinals of the sprint. And as we've mentioned in recent weeks and months, still looks a long way from the athlete, of course, uh, that has picked up all those Olympic medals in the past. So from Minsk to Glasgow, British Cycling have announced their team for the the Glasgow event, the second leg of this World Cup series. Katie Archibald is top of the bill, if you like. One of six 
Olympic medalist that's been named. Eleanor Barker, Ed Clancy, Philip Hines, Jason Kenny, and Katie Marchant. The others, uh, no Laura Kenny in Glasgow, but just to run through the men's endurance team, Clancy, Ethan Hayter, Charlie Tanfield, Ollie Wood. The women's endurance team, Archibald Barker, Nia Evans and Ellie Dickinson. Remember, Nia Evans and Katie Archibald did well at the six-day event in London recently. Uh, in the men's sprint, Hines, Kenny, Jack Carlin, Ryan Owens and Joe Truman. And in the women's sprint, Marchant, Lauren Bates, Sophie Kate. Well, and Millie Tanner as well. And remember, there's paracycling in Glasgow as well on the 8th of November. And best wishes to Adam Blythe, who has announced he's retiring this week from Elite Cycling too. And the backroom staff continue to be assembled ahead of Tokyo 2020 with British Cycling making two appointments this week. Former Great Britain cycling team athlete and coach John Norfolk is returning from Cycling Australia into the new role of head of Tokyo performance planning. Paul Mullen switches from sailing to the velodrome as head of performance support team. He's currently head of sports science and medicine at the British sailing team. And Norfolk has spent two years in Adelaide. He's understood he wants to come home for his family. And Cycling Australia chief exec Steve Drake added, he's serving a notice period with us, and I said to him, I wish you luck, but not too much. <laughs> and talking of backroom staff, the Board of UK Athletics and Performance Director Neil Black have released a statement over the past few days conver- confirming they have parted company on mutually acceptable terms. Uh, Neil Black has completed his role last month as Performance Director at UK Athletics. Following the World Championships, he got caught up, of course, in the Mo Farah and Alberto Salazar affair, uh, which is ongoing as well, which hasn't helped. Uh, he has facilitated a full handover, according to the statement, He spent in total 15 years at the organisation and there'll be another now high-level appointment required at UK Athletics. I've seen a new chair and a new chief exec in, in recent months too. And in rowing, Pete Reid has announced this week, the three-time Olympic gold medalist Pete Reid, five-time world rowing champion as well, has announced some sad news this week, that he's been paralysed from below his chest after suffering a spinal stroke. He said on Instagram, there's a very small chance I'll recover fully and a very small chance of no recovery at all. He's now waiting to see the extent of the damage following some tests and then how well he rehabs. I remember he was in the military as well as being an Olympic rower. Uh, The doctors don't know why there was a disruption to the blood supply to the spinal cord, which is what caused this uh, spinal stroke. And he joked on Instagram as well. He said, my arms are still strong and my brain is still as average as ever. There's something very British and very Olympic and very military in that sentence. We wish him well. We certainly do. And Great Britain's rowing squad took two medals in the first ever World Rowing Beach Sprint Finals. Staged in China, competitors had to run to their boats then get in the water and race, rather than a normal holding start. Uh, GB won bronze in the Cox Quadruple Skulls, with the crew of Jerry Owen, Gillian Mara, Robin Hartwinks, Kieran Brown and Cox Kate Parkinson, beating France for a medal, and Robin won her second medal of the weekend on Sunday with silver in the women's solo. And in Strictly Come Dancing, don't normally finish with that, do we? Uh, Will Bailey's had to pull out with a serious knee injury. Uh, the para table tennis players' uh, time in the Strictly Ballroom is over. I would say check out our uh, GB Bosses interview with Sarah Sutcliffe. Now, she doesn't actually run para table tennis, but we did ask the question of her. Would she advise uh, one of her leading athletes to take part in a reality TV show? so soon ahead of a major event like an Olympics or the Paralympics. It's definitely worth checking out and hearing her response to that one. More discussion as well about combining elite sport and reality TV and the need to kind of balance uh, your performance on the field of play and also getting your name, your face and your sport out there in our next episode of GB Bosses. I can't tell you any more than that because John (laughs) will have to take me outside and, well, maybe just give me a severe telling off. Who knows? But it drops... On Wednesday. Another slap on the wrist. Uh, We wish Will all the best of luck, of course. Now, Tokyo 2020, maybe it should be all anyone in Olympic and Paralympic sport is thinking about. Sports Social Podcast Network. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere 
even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.